name is Yi Chao, and I work as a machine learning research scientist at Layer 6. Today, I will talk about the papers that describes Layer 6's winning solution for the 2018 Rexus Challenge, two-stage model for automatic playlist continuation at scale. So the ACM Rexus Challenge is one of the largest annual competition in the recommender systems community. Each year, the Rexus Challenge attracts widespread attention from both the academia and the industry. Past winners of this prestigious com competition include Alibaba in 2016 and uh, Yandex in year 2015. And the first Rexus Challenge was um, held in year 2010. And for its first seven years, no team was able to win it twice. In year 2017 and year 2018, Layer 6 became the consecutive winner for two years in a row, making us the first team to achieve this accom accomplishment. So according to the um, official statistics released by the competition organizer, for the 2018 Rexus Challenge, there are um, 1,791 participants from 410 teams, and they made a total of 1,467 submissions. Layer 6 submission ranked the first in both the main track and the creative track of the competition. So the, the Rexus 2018 challenge was hosted by Spotify. Mm. Um, so the, the challenge itself is dedicated to evaluating and uh, advancing state-of-the-art research for automatic playlist continuation using the large-scale real-world datasets released by Spotify. The dataset, which is called the Million Playlist, playlist Dataset, contains one million playlists with over two million songs. So the task is called Playlist Continuation Set. Given an, um, a playlist of arbitrary length, we need to um, fill that um, playlist with the recommended songs. The models are, eva are evaluated on a subset of 10,000 playlists for which a subset of the playlists are withheld. And to preserve the integrity of the um, competition and to prevent overfitting, the tests that are not released to the public and the submissions must be uh, submitted to the public survey and uh, ev evaluated by Spotify. So now I will talk about some unique aspects of the Spotify Rexus Challenge that is also our motivation for joining this competition. So as we all know, a lot of tasks um, in NLP or in recommender system have a sequential nature. And um, the million sum playlist dataset from Spotify is one of the largest datasets in, um, in the academia. And we think, we believe that the um, experience learned from this challenge can be easily transferred to other tasks, such as recommender systems um, or natural language processing tasks. And um, as some people may know, Layer 6 has been acquired by the TD Bank. And uh, for we do client work for TD Bank. And at banks, we need to handle a lot of textual data and also transactional data that is inherently sequential. So we believe that um, by doing this competition, we can learn um, valuable experience that helps us in our daily job. So here is the statistics for the million sound playlist. So it contains a total of one million playlist sounds with over two million unique sounds. And um, there, the these songs contain um, a large number of unique al albums and artists. And uh, this is how the data set actually looks like. So, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the question, yeah. So the question is, uh, what is the number of unique normalized playlist titles? So um, this, it is that so sometimes um, we have um, a lot of playlists that are like um, semantically similar, but they are actually um, differ in, in like punctuations or like spaces. 
So we normalize the tax and, uh, and uh, to reduce the number of playlist titles. This will be helpful when we deal with um, code start. That is, when um, Spotify asks us to provide a playlist continuation, given only the title without sounds, we need the playlist title to um, do this task. Is that clear? Um, and um, so this is how the data set looks like. So um, it basically contains some meta information about the playlist, such as its name, um, the date it is modified, and the, the number of tracks and albums, and also uh, the sounds that are within this playlist. So um, as I mentioned, the test playlist contains 10,000 playlists in total. They're divided into 10 different categories. So the models has to uh, work well under all kinds of scenarios that um, given um, the observed sounds of range from zero to 100, the model needs to um, work well and uh, provide a satisfying recommendation. So um, for example, the first category is to predict tracks for playlists given its title only. So this is um, an extremely hard problem in recommender system, referred to as code start. And um, for the rest of the um, categories, we have um, either playlists with titles and uh, without titles, and also with the first few tracks and uh, with some random tracks. So this, um, the reason that Spotify um, divides the playlists the test playlist like this is that this actually more closely simulates the production scenario, set scenarios that the models need to work well under all stage of the playlist um, creation. <coughs> so now I will talk about our approach to this competition. So our approach um, is based on a two-stage architecture. So the first stage focuses on reducing the large 2.2 million sound search space to a much smaller subset of candidates for each playlist. So with a combination of, um, of collaborative filtering and deep learning models, we were able to retrieve 20,000 sounds for each playlist with a recall of over 90%. And uh, moreover, um, for the top 1,000 playlists, it already covers a recall of about 60%. So reducing the um, set of candidate sounds in the first stage enables us to, um, it, it, enables, it enables the second stage model to focus on only this small subset of candidates without significant loss of accuracy. It also enables us to apply more sophisticated um, algorithms for second stage without a concern of running time. And then based on the um, candidate, Play, uh, sounds given by the first stage, the second stage aims at re-ranking um, these candidates um, and maximizing the accuracy at the top of the recommended playlist. We used um, the pairwise gradient boosting algorithm for the second stage. And also, um, as I mentioned, there's um, 10,000 code star playlists that we need to um, give um, recommendations given only the um, titles, so we use a separate method for dealing with code stat. Method, yeah, question. You will play with this kind of playlist. Is this kind of playlist is a sequence or is a set? Is the se is the sequence in this playlist important, or the sound of the, <coughs> or just you, you just include all the correct sounds in this recommended uh, playlist? So the question is that is like the sequential nature of the playlist important. That is important. So um, it's important both um, when we modeling, when we do modeling, and both when um, when the like um, organize evaluate. So um, we, as I will talk about later, we use a convolutional neural network approach to capture the temporal nature of the playlist that um, has shown very good result and very significant improvement for our approach, and also for the uh, evaluation of this task, they actually um, evaluate on NDCG that um, if you 
if your like if the ground truth is ranked higher, you give you are given a higher um, score. Playlist and the user wanted one to one mapping? Um, so the question is that is there a one to one mapping for? I think we, um, I think in this uh, challenge we don't have access to the user information. So basically we like um, treat the playlist as a user and uh, uh, identifies a unique user, right? In your assumption. Yeah, in our assumption. So a playlist is a user and uh, the sum or the track is the item. Mm -hmm. and question. I just want to clarify, when you say playlist title, so it's an arbitrary title name string or is it like a genre of music? So these are uh, Spotify playlists that the users create, right? So okay. it could be anything. It's depending on, on the user who created the playlist. So they name it any other. Yeah, it could be anything. It could even be just be a couple of smileys or something. Probably the title well and yeah. include the type, the types yeah. of the music. Uh, it could depends on the user. These are like all the real uh, playlists, so it's all. What is it? Spotify. Actually, we found some extremely hard cases when the title is only con like consists only of emojis, and uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> really hard to continue. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering if you can explain evaluation more, or if you're going to go into that more. Is um, it about like the numerical ranking associated with each one, or is it like how? Yeah. How so the question is, how is um, the model evaluated in this competition? So, actually, I'm going to talk about this in the second part of uh, this. So you'll explain recall and everything in second part. <coughs> so you'll explain recall and everything in second part, or like how do you calculate with high recall and everything? Oh, we actually we used our local validation set. So we did a split of set because um, for this competition, there's a, like a limit of one submission per day. So we cannot um, do like multiple submissions to evaluate. So we create our local validation set that mimics the, um, how the, 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 the distribution of the test playlist. So that's one thing we found very important that. So we need to um, create a validation set that looks like this, that creates these 10 categories of um, tracks. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to understand the problem and the context a little more. So can I assume this type of problem similar to the problem of one user just uh, having a series of website clicking activities, and then you're trying to just classify uh, the, the sequence of clickings uh, into different categories. Are they similar problems as this? So the question is that is this problem similar to um, some like um, website what? clicking? Can we, can we save that for like comparison sort of things? Let's save that for the discussion. Okay. Uh, just very quickly, it's a recommender system. So Amazon, you want to buy items. So user and items. It's a retrieval problem basically. So you want to retrieve all the relevant instances. Okay, so let's go. So, so here is the architectural overview of our model. So our model actually works um, using a two-stage model. So um, actually, um, so firstly, we use the weighted regularized matrix factorization to quickly retrieve 20,000 candidate sounds. Without uh, with high recall, then um, um, for each of the um, retrieves candidate sounds, we use um, the convolutional neural network and user use an item item neighborhood based recommendation model to compute model scores for each um, candidate sound, and the the model score for um, all of these four models are blended together using a linear combination and. Um, the blend score together with um, the raw score of all the four um, models are passed to the second stage. Um, so the second stage takes as input the scores given by the first stage models and also um, some features, playlist features and playlist sum features extracted from the um, data set directly. So then um, we train the pairwise um, XGBoost model and then it gives the um, prediction. 
um, and also um, as code start for code start as there's uh, no collaborative filtering techniques that can be applied we treated them separately and uh, so to encourage um, the, simplicity, to, the simplicity and to um, improve generalization we use one model to solve all the um, nine task, test categories except for code start. So actually in the competition, there were some teams that used 10 different models to solve the um, tasks for these 10 uh, <coughs> categories. So one unique aspect of our model is that we use one model to do it. So we do it deliberately because um, in the concern of time and, the, and training and inference time. The first is state. You mentioned four or five. I'm talking about the scores. When, when you when you ingest that to the XGBoost. So um, there are five, right? Yes, five if you consider uh, the blend as yeah, the, the score. Yeah, the blend is also in, like um, given as input to the XGBoost. Because the behavior was mentioned five, so I think you, 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 and you counted the blend as well, right? Yeah, and uh, that's very important. Yeah. But did you, give, did you give weight to the blend as well, too? Um, so the question is that um, how do we extract the raw score for XGBoost? So actually we run a greedy like a um, grid search for um, weighting coefficients from 0, zero to 0 0.5 with an interval of 0 0.1 and uh, to um, and our local validation set to determine how we blend the scores. Our, I, I understood that part, but so when you have five scores, you have the weights with them too, right? When you uh, input that to the XG boost, right? So do you have like an assigned weight for the blend uh, score as well or not? So basically the blend score goes into the XG boost, and for the rest of the four, uh, we basically use the user and the item weightings uh, in some way, which we'll be using a bit more. Basically, basically what we do is we use the weightings and we uh, calculate similarities. For instance, okay. so, so this is the architecture diagram. Please keep your questions to what's in there. They're, they're definitely they're going to go through the methods. Right? Please keep your questions for the, the items that we've seen so far, not guessing what's in the future. Thank you. So, so our first talk about the latent factor model we used to retrieve 20,000 candidate sound from the 2.2 uh, million sound search space. So we use the weighted regularized matrix factorization model. The reason we use that is that um, collaborative filtering model has shown to be work very well um, in large scale data sets and also scale very well. And uh, um, it allows us to do quick inference for the first stage. So here is the formula for the weighted regularized matrix factorization model we used. So the model is weighted because here, um, um, different from the traditional matrix factorization, we put a weight um, or, or a confidence score for each um, observation. So that is calculated by one plus alpha times rij. Rij is either one or zero, depending on whether the sum is in the playlist or not. And uh, the model is regularized because um, we add um, these regularization terms um, to, um, to prevent the model from overfitting. It's actually um, like um, adding the regularization term this way is actually equivalent to placing zero means spherical Gaussian prior on the user and item latent vectors. So with the weighted regularized matrix factorization alone, we were able to retrieve the 20,000 sounds with a recall of over 90%. And uh, so this is the, like, the, first stage, the first part of the first stage. And uh, we also use the, a deep convolution neural network for further filter, f filtering out the irrelevant um, sounds from the playlist. So actually, if, um, if people read the paper, we actually used um, both matrix factorization, CN, and user use and item item embeddings. And uh, because this is a deep learning um, series, so I will focus mostly on the convolutional neural network embeddings. 
So the reason we use CNNs is that most collaborative filtering models ignore the temporal order in the user item interactions. It, it is actually very hard to encode such order in the objective function of uh, collaborative filtering models. However, in sequential recommendation tasks such as playlist continuation, the temporal orders often contains very valuable information that helps us to uh, helps the recommender system to provide personalization. So um, we can assume that um, sounds that um, like our order together in the playlist has are, should be very relevant to each other. So traditionally, people in um, modeling these temporal um, relationships are using recurrent neural network based methods. In this challenge, we did not use that because RNNs, are, like in its nature, is sequential and it's hard to parallelize. But for CNNs, it's fully parallelizable and um, um, modern architectures such, such as G GPU, it can be accelerated and uh, the inference is super fast. So um, the way we do the CN embedding is that we observe this, that there is an ana analogy between playlist sound uh, relationship and the uh, document and word um, uh, relationship. So we can actually cast the problem of sequential recommendation um, to the pro problem of language modeling. So in language modeling, given um, a document or given a set of pre-observed uh, words, you need, um, the model is required to predict the words that follows. And um, that's also what is required um, to do here. Given a set of observed sounds in a playlist, we need to continue it and um, provide recommendations to fill this playlist. So, and uh, in the literature, CNNs has been shown very well to be competitive with RN-based models in language modeling. So actually we adapt um, the paper um, proposed by Dolphin et al. in 2017 to the problem of sequential recommendation in our, um, in our competition. So now I give the architecture um, diagram of our CN models. So it, can, it actually consists of three parts. The first part is the playlist sum embedding, and then um, the activations from the playlist sum embeddings go through a cascade of um, GLU convolutional, com convolution blocks. And finally, we use another embedding layer to obtain the playlist embedding. So here is the detail of the playlist sum embedding. But the playlist sound embedding is um, created by a concatenation of the sound vectors um, that has been observed in the playlist. We initialize the uh, sound vectors using the weights that um, a trained weighted re regularized matrix factorization model gives. And then we embed it um, for, for this task for dealing with um, playlists of arbitrary lengths, we pad all the playlists to a size of 50 and uh, to, um, so, so as we can easily batch find all the playlists. And uh, for the uh, second part of the convolutional, neur um, con con convolutional neural network embedding model, it's um, a cascade of um, gated linear units uh, I think earlier when you were showing the average size of playlists, the average size was something like 66, which is bigger than 50. So I'm wondering what you did in cases like that where it's bigger than the padded size. Well, we sample in that case. So if it is bigger, we, we just sample. But the smaller size. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The question is how to deal with playlists is actually longer than 50. So we can use a sliding window approach mm -hmm. that um, covers that. Uh, the top, yeah. And what is V? Is this coming from the, the factorization or Sorry? the vector V for each sign? Oh, yeah. So uh, the question is that where does the vector V comes from? So we compare the random initialization with the initialization from um, the uh, ARS, that is the weight, weight, weighted regularized matrix factorization. So 
um, we found mm -hmm. that it's consistently better to apply the weights initialized from um, CF methods to, it's actually kind of word embedding because um, if you, uh, because I, I remember one paper said that matrix factorization is like implicitly doing uh, virtual vect kind of stuff, embedding. So that provides a good initialization for the model. So um, we use the gated linear units also. Sorry, just a follow up question. So yeah. embeddings are for tokens, right? Usually. So then your words here are songs. So the embeddings would be uh, uh, songs or presentations. Is that correct? Yeah. How is that? Uh, is, is that, that, was the, that was the question embedding, or was, was it about, uh, the question was about an initialization of embeddings or initialization of the words? Uh, of these, like initialization. So this gating mechanism is similar to the gating and long short-term memory unit. So actually, it helps model to combat the vanishing gradient problems that prevents the model from going deeper. So, so we use a cascade of GRU convolutional neural network because um, in this way, the model can gradually learn higher level information. So ba basically, when CN models are applied to um, language modeling or playlist continuation. It can be thought of as an n-gram model that the, the n, n in the n-gram is the stride, uh, is the size of your filter. And uh, by stacking um, more and more um, convolutional blocks on top of each other, we can, the, the model can ex extract high level features that uh, spans across the entire sequence. So, and um, um, to facilitate training, we also um, add batch normalization and also to, also we add the dropout to um, prevent overfitting. So, actually, so um, for the CN model, it's actually considering the temporal orders and uh, um, in comparison, the um, user, user, item, item, or the matrix factorization model can be thought of as a bag of word model in NLP if we make an like, analogy. And uh, this is um, how each GLU convolution block looks like. So note that we use residual connection within each GLU block. This also helps the gradient to be passed through early uh, layers of the model and uh, to and allow us to build deeper models in our competition. And finally, so the layer after the GLU convolution is a max pooling layer. Here we use max um, of top three pooling. And uh, the, max, the use of the max pooling layer is um, twofold. Firstly, um, it helps us to deal better with um, playlist of variable lengths because after max pooling, uh, only the activation from the maximally ac activated neuron will be um, will be like extracted, and um, the c the s hidden size of um, of the model after the max pooling layer will only depend on the number of filters you have in the convolutional network. And also, um, adding pooling layer has been a common practice in. Um, vision and NLP to uh, do downsampling and uh, reduce the model size and to provide um, better results. So empirically, we found that the best results can be achieved if we use 900 kernels for each convolution and um, we stack seven GLU blocks on top of each other. And um, we use add up optimizer and uh, use back propagation to do um, gradient descent optimization. So, so here is the training objective formulation of our CN model. So, um, uh, sorry, yeah. can I ask a quick clarification question of the previous slide? Uh, you said we, we update the initial latents on each uh, epoch. Uh, is that every latent uh, sort of variable in, in, in the model? 
Uh, so you, when so I, I guess I'm asking what do you mean by we are, we are updating. So the, uh, so the initial uh, song latex, right? When you when you when you, uh, so the main model is like you concatenate the song in balance, right? And then you feed it to the model. So when, when the gradients back propagate, it will just go to those songs which were part of that playlist, right? So. So the embeddings, if I may call, the first layer will also get uh, updated. Yeah, yeah, the input basically that gets updated. I see. Yeah. I see. Uh, so that's an alternative to keeping the embeddings fixed. Yeah, right. Like we saw it, it works better. We keep updating. So why not? Why not? Why not? Why not uh, okay, that's a why question. So later on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So here is the training objective of our CN model. So after um, each playlist is passed through the CEM, it gives a fixed dimensional vector of real values. That is what we refer to as playlist embeddings. And the probability that a sum is pr present in a playlist is defined by um, a sigmoid nonlinearity over the dot product between the um, playlist embedding and the sum embedding. So during training, um, the objective for the model is to raise the probability of the sounds that follow um, f follow in this playlist and also uh, minimizing the probability for it predicting the sounds that um, is irrelevant in this playlist. So we empirically found that uh, if we predict the next three sounds instead of ju just predicting the next one sound, it gives better results. So this is one of the difference from NLP because in language modeling, people only predict the next one sound, but here the next three sounds are also quite relevant. Yeah. Do you know how Spotify is actually judging? Like uh, evaluating? <coughs> yeah. are, are they doing like you have to get the next exact one? Like how do they assess it? So actually I'm going to talk about this in the result. Okay, you keep asking. So it's, for yeah. this it's basically sort of similar to recall precision, okay? Okay. Yeah. This is mainly clarification question. So mm -hmm. the task is similar, like the dot to rate task, that you know they have these paragraphs and you want to apply up the relation to paragraphs. But instead of using the word to rate in that you are using this CNN framework which tries to do the same you know, task. Is that is that what you're saying correctly? Then? Yeah, so the question is about the difference between our formulation and the doctor back formulation. So um, the problem with word to back or doctor back, I think we tested um, on this set because but in the original formulation they they are so although um, in the literature doctor back and word to back method are referred to as deep learning models, but they actually only contain one, one hidden layer. So this is uh, not powerful enough to capture the uh, sophisticated relationship between the data in our test. So we actually benchmark the performance of word to back, dog to back, and CNs. And, uh, and uh, after comparison, we found CM to work much better. And uh, the other difference is, I guess, that you have to take the sequences order into, into account as well. Because in the dog to back, this order are necessary for getting. So, so the question is, CNN may keep sequence better than word to back. I mean, their task, they, they, they so I emphasize that the so sequence, the sequence was important for them, but if they yeah. got to break the sequence. Yeah, so CNN back. doesn't inherently have any sequential. I mean, the task they're trying to solve, what you're saying was, this is a similar task as back to break, but there are subtle differences that I want to clarify. With them. Also going deeper helps us to capture the long term dependencies. Yeah. So just then looking at the next word, right? We're looking at like the entire sequence. Right. Like as you go deeper. Yeah, if you have a uh, like um, for if for each layer you have a filter size of K and uh, you stack D layers, you, then you can capture the long range uh, relationship of K to the D um, and uh, it's actually exponentially growing if we stack more layers on top of CNN. So when you stack more layers, it's like, for example, a song is in this particular playlist and also in other particular playlists, and then you try to understand the relationship between these two playlists? No, no, it's one How playlist. does this work? It's one playlist at a time. So all the songs in one playlist, you feed it as one. 
part of the batch. So how does this stack occur? So, so, so if, if I may quickly jump in. So it's CNNs have a few layers, right? right. So receptive field of your last layer has has a very long, uh, is, is, is a long one. So right. it's usually works with is like four, uh, five words uh, before and after. So a uh, context of only 10, um, you can go much longer uh, with, with CNN. Yeah. Oh, you hear the context windows expanded to the whole layers, right? Yeah, it can. It could. So that's the thing we learn for the right? The way we learn that, where to look. And by stacking, you try to get the whole playlist together? That's the reason for stacking, or is just it's just so the, You're talking about stacking the different layers of the convolution block, the GLU blocks, right? Right. So, so they're, 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 they're just, just a But it doesn't correspond to anything you know, physical in the problem, right? It's just an architecture of method. Yeah, architecture. Yeah, so we empirically found that predicting next sounds, next three sounds, sounds instead of one gives better result. And uh, in our experiments, we used um, 10, 10 negative samples um, in the training um, objective. That is, um, in the second part of this um, e equation, uh, formula, formula, we uh, sampled 10 irrelevant sounds from the 2.2 million um, candidate playlist sounds as negative samples for the CEN. So we, we benchmark the running time of CNs and the RNs to, and um, we found that um, CN models are consistently two times or two five times faster than RNs. So, and um, um, it's much faster and uh, it's competitive uh, in terms of um, performance with RN models. That's why we used CN models throughout in our um, co competition. So, and uh, now I'll give a, a brief summary of our first stage uh, model. So, so, given a playlist, we first used the um, matrix factorization approach to retrieve 20,000 candidate cells. And then, um, we use um, CNs, item item, and user user to create model specific scores for each sounds within that candidate um, playlist. Then we do a blend of the scores. So, um, so the blend is by greatly um, um, finding the best coefficients for um, combining these scores with within the range of 0 to 0 0.5. Then um, we concatenate the scores from these four uh, models and also the blend score to the second stage model as the input. So for our second stage model, we... Yeah. I just want to know, when you said do the grid search to the blend, what is the objective? When you to, to which kind of your objective function to get the best of what for uh, the So the question is that how do we choose um, the coefficients for the blend? Yeah. So actually we just use uh, like yeah actually we focus on MDCG uh -huh. um, and uh, on the validation set and uh, we just write four four loops. So NDCG is um, preferred in because we find that um, NDCG some some gains in NDCG on the validation set consistently gives you um, higher performance on the test set because NDCG is the only metric in the three metrics in this competition that considers both your record and how well you rank the playlist um, that you provide. So our second. And stage model is only applied to a small subset of sounds that is retrieved by the first stage. We use the excellent XGBoost library for doing the second stage. The objective is to learn the pairwise correlation between the playlists and the sounds that is hard to encode in the first stage by the um, CF methods or the CNNs. So, we actually spent a lot of effort in doing feature engineering for the second stage. So, and we found that 
um, careful feature engineering actually boosts the performance a lot on the leaderboard. So for uh, the second stage model, the input can be categorized into four feature groups. The first um, is the, the input from the first stage, that is um, the five models that comes from the four individual models and their blend. And uh, we also include playlist features, such as playlist names, playlist lengths, and uh, some metadata for the sounds and the artists and the albums in that playlist. And uh, for, for the third category, we include sound features, including the duration of the sounds and uh, the artists uh, that create the sound and also the albums that um, include the sound, etc. And um, last but not least, we include playlist sound features into our model. Actually, we found that this is the most um, dominant feature that um, helps you to improve the score. So, because um, for this, this category, it's actually capturing the playlist pair, playlist sound pair um, features. And uh, that's the um, most important features when doing playlist continuation. So, features in this category include the similarity between the candidate sound and uh, the sounds already in the observed playlist, and uh, also um, the uh, similarity between the playlists uh, that already contains this sound and uh, also the current, and the current playlist. So this gives a brief sense of how we do feature engineering for the second stage. The similarity is completely based on the previous embedded features. So the for similarity, um, we use the latents from the single models. So say the CNM or the <coughs> LRMF latents. Okay. Can you say that again? So we use uh, the latents from the single models for calculating the similarities. So say the CNM and mostly we use CNM and the LRMF. So, and uh, for training the second stage model, that is XGBoost, um, the model is um, trained um, for each playlist the, we randomly sample up to 20 positive sounds, that is, um, that is the sound that is in our uh, split, uh, of our uh, second stage split, and also 20 hard negative sounds. Here, what we mean by hard negative sounds is that the sounds that are actually not in the playlist, but given a, but were given a high score by the first stage model. So this um, um, allows the um, ActGBoost model to um, learn to deal with these complicated cases. And also we found that it's very important to include the um, first stage um, features that the, the, um, the scores from the first stage to the extra boost model. So the reason is that this helps mo the model to quickly learn how to utilize these um, already learned scores and then gradually learn how to combine the playlist sound and the playlist sound features for further boosting the performance. And uh, last but not least, uh, we need to handle the um, 10,000 uh, and the 1,000 playlists in the tasset that uh, only provides the playlist names. So how we handle the code start uh, scenario is that we use the name SVD approach. Basically speaking, we form the R name matrix um, using um, the sounds and the, the playlists. So the columns respond to the names and the, the, the names of the playlists and the the rows um, corresponds to the sounds. And um, so it's basically a sparse matrix with um, ones when the sound is in the playlist. So we factorize the, this R name matrix using SVD and uh, obtain the U name and the V name matrix for the playlist and the sounds. And then um, we use the dot product between the sounds and the the playlists for uh, retrieval during inference time. Yeah. This is just like the term document matrix, right? So, yeah. okay. so it's um, here the, um, 
the columns correspond to the name, and uh, that's the normalized name. So we found that normalizing the name reduces your um, column size and helps better. Uh, this might not be the greatest question, but from the slide before, you said you're randomly sampling hard, um, not relevant, or not playlist songs. How is hard to find there? Is that just the fact it was one of the 20,000 candidates, or is it higher scored songs from that set of 20,000? So the question is that how do we define hard um, examples in our second stage model? So we use, so actually in the first stage, these models, um, the blend actually gives you a ranking of these 20,000 songs. And then um, we just um, find the songs, the songs that ranked higher, like rank, ranked highly by the blended model, and uh, but not in the ground truth. And we treat them as hard, um, hard negative sounds because if we only give the active root trivial method, it will soon like converge to a local minima and uh, cannot get any better. So, yeah, question? The names as columns? Uh, would this model be able to handle a completely new name then? A new playlist name that it's never seen before? Yeah, so the way we <coughs> found this matrix is um, we take, so the columns are basically tokens, right? Word tokens. So just a, a word from the playlist name? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and for songs, it's basically uh, you first take the union of all the song, all the playlists which contain the song, and then you tokenize that further. And then, okay. and you, and then you factorize this, so basically you can have a. Uh, so then you would have a problem if the playlist has a word, is only one word, and that word has never been in a playlist name before? Yeah, I mean, definitely you wouldn't probably do that yeah. there, but then still you can retrieve from that, right? That would still give you a vector, which you can retrieve easily. I also have a quick question from the last slide. So, so you're you're saying 20 relevant and 20 not relevant, right? So it, it makes it like the whole linear classification problem. But at the end, you're you're uh, providing like a a list of 500 songs, right? So how does 20 positive and 20 negative adds up to like 500 uh, at the end? That's true. So the question is that. Um, how do we generate the 500 sounds yeah. at the end? So actually, um, when you trained, uh, after you trained the x model for each playlist and, and the sum, for each playlist sum pair, it gives you a score. And then basically we use the scores given by x to rank them and uh, sort it and give, get the top 500 and uh, use that as the output. Does the embeddings in your model have the same, for example, usage like the word to make? Because in the word to make, you can add and subtract and find it the most, for example, closest uh, embedding to the new word could result in something which is meaningful. But in here, did you, did you test such a thing and was it meaningful or not? So the question is that is yes, um, the embedding from the, this model like uh, operate in a linear space as uh, the word to back model? Actually, we don't. Uh, we we haven't tested it, but I believe that for um, CF methods like um, uh, weighted regularized matrix factorization, it should have some similar um, properties, um, because as we all know, it's implicitly doing virtual rack objective. If you um, use the uh, noise contrastive estimation as the objective. And, but for CN embeddings, I believe that as um, it's learning highly nonlinear dependencies between the models, I presume that it will not have this property. But um, I need to admit that we haven't tried it yet. And when you, when the, the final task is to generate 500 sounds, is this kind of sound is a sequence or just uh, sounds? Sequence. So one, one of the metrics does, does the sequence. The sequence, but rankings is important. But you you have it, but you have a, you have the sounds of scores, but you have you, you just the uh, recommend the sounds from the of the scores from the highest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
excuse me, this matrix factorization, isn't it expensive? Uh, how did you, you batched it? Uh, okay, okay. That's, that's not a clarification question. Let's get, that, let's get to that sure. next session. There was a question over there. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're good? Okay. So let's... Break? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to have a break.
Okay, so um, all of our code is written in our own Java stack, and uh, we choose Java because um, it's very fast, it's memory efficient, and uh, you can easily do um, parallel co computing using Java. And uh, um, so, ba um, specifically, we for the WRMF model, we used ALS that refers to alternate least squares for solving the user and an item latent factor matrix. And uh, alternating this square means that um, it mm, alternates um, between the optimization for user matrix and item matrix um, that you first fix the user matrix and solve the, the exact value for the item matrix. And then you fix the item matrix and solve the exact value for the mm, ma user matrix using these square methods. And, uh, you iterate it through 10 epochs. And uh, we utilize our Java um, um, ML core library and uh, it greatly accelerates our computing specifically for the ALS solving of the WRMF method. And uh, um, training the first stage and together with the second stage, end-to-end um, -end takes a proc approximately 12 hours on a single Ubuntu server with um, 40 CPUs and one Titan V GPU. And uh, for inference, we can do pretty fast because our, uh, our, our, of our excellent Java stack. For each playlist, we can create um, sound recommendations within only 50 milliseconds. <coughs> so now we talk about the results. Um, as I mentioned, um, this competition uh, employs a very uh, rigorous uh, evaluation metric so that um, we only evaluated our, our second stage model on the public leaderboard. So here I presented our validation results. So as we can see, um, for, um, for the code start model, actually the name SVD um, improves over the popularity-based recommendation model by a lot. And uh, also, uh, some we observed that WRMF, CN, item item, and user user perform very well on their own. And, uh, but when we blend them together, it gives a uh, um, significant gain in terms of both the R precision and DCG and clicks. So, um, I think I should uh, explain some of the metrics now, and I, that answers the, some questions um, before. So here, R precision basically um, evaluates the um, the percentage of overlap between your retrieved sounds and uh, the ground truth. So you, I, I think we can think of this as a recall question because uh, recall problem because. The, your retrieve sound is of fixed size of 500. And uh, so basically speaking, the more you record from the ground truth, the higher the R precision will be. And uh, NDCG is a common metric employed in um, ranking problems in recommender systems. So basically, uh, it not only considers how good the set of candidates you are, but um, the higher the ground truth you ranked in your generated recommendation, the higher the score you will receive. And uh, so for our precision and NDCG, um, these metrics, the higher the, um, the, these metrics, the better the performance of your model is. And the clicks, the, the, the clicks metrics actually um, invented by the Spotify company. So actually, uh, uh, um, what, mm, according to the mm, competition website, what it measures is that how many clicks um, the, um, the, it, it requires the user to do in order to complete a playlist using our model. So for each click, you get um, 50 sounds uh, from, um, from recommendation. And uh, basically, if um, clicks is true, that means that you need to click two times and see 100 sounds in order to get and your desired sound to include in the um, playlist. So, so for that reason, for, for clicks, it's um, the smaller the metric, the um, better the performance of the model, yes. 
and uh, mm, we can see that um, the first is that first lay blend consistently improves over all the four first stage models um, in terms of an um, order and uh, across all the three metrics. And also our second stage model actually offers a huge boost in those metrics. So um, here um, is how we um, blend the four models from the first stage. This actually answers the questions um, uh, in the first part of the talk. So uh, we do grid search from 0 to 0 0.5 with um, uh, an interval of 0 0.1 for finding the best weights to combine these scores. And uh, before we um, pass these scores we, to, the, um, to the blend model, we, we normalize it uh, or we, we we standardize it to make their scores comparable because um, in its like raw values, the scores are not directly comparable. And uh, this is the um, optimal um, set of coefficients we have found to give us uh, in, an improvement over the um, base models. So um, another thing is that in this, um, this uh, table, we can see that um, it seems that CN model performs the worst among the four models, but actually when we go to the blend, actually it is assigned the highest um, coefficient um, by the blend model. So actually this suggests that temporal order matters and um, mm, without CN, um, the performance is hurt by a lot. Mm, because um, the, the, here the coefficients are directly comparable because as I said, we normalize the score to make them in the same range. Um, and uh, also we found that our second stage model um, consistently adds over a one point in both our precision and the uh, NDCG. And we also found that um, for clicks, to optimize clicks, is actually you need to do uh, employ tree based method to, so as to better optimize uh, clicks and uh, the 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 attributes is one of um, kind of tree based mod model so that it significantly uh, improves the clicks and uh, um, also we uh, to compare our performance on code start we compare um, our name SVD approach with the popularity based method. So popularity based method is a commonly used baseline in recommender system that uh, we just rank the players according to their popularity or the number of their occurrence in the whole data set. And uh, we found that um, the name SVD approach um, is, um, improves quite a lot over the popularity based methods. But still, um, code start is a hard problem so that um, it's hard to match the second stage result we have found in our validation set. And uh, now this is the leaderboard result. So because of the submission rules, we only submit our best model for evaluation. And uh, um, we, um, our team VR6 ranks the first in both um, our precision and NDCG metric. And uh, we place the second in terms of clicks. So this border metric is how, um, so is how finally the, uh, all the submissions are ranked. So basically uh, speaking, if there are 80 points and uh, your R precision is the highest, then you will see a point of 80. And if your R precision is placed a second, you receive a point of uh, 79 for that, uh, for that uh, metric. And uh, the border score is, uh, is calculated by summing up all the, uh, all the points you have got from the, um, the, f f from, from the three metrics. So in total, there are 110 teams. So we, we get, um, 110 from the first two metrics and 109 from the last metric. <coughs> so
So, and uh, in the last part, I will give some qualitative result of our uh, model. So, um, although the um, statistic, the like quantitative result looks extremely good, but people are um, curious about how it will perform in real world cases. So we did three case studies and we found that uh, our model consistently um, preserved the playlist themes and uh, also it has a sense of diversity that it not only recommends um, the sound that is composed by the same um, artist that composed the sound in the playlist, uh, in the observed playlist, but it also um, has um, encouraged diversity by in uh, recommending sounds from different artists. <coughs> so here is um, some um, samples we um, have made. And uh, places too. And uh, also on classic music, also our model works very well. So I think basically the model learns to somehow first um, find um, some some sound that is um, composed by the same artist and if there is no more then they found some sound that is from the same genre with the sounds in the playlist. So that concludes my talk for today and uh, now it's discussion time. So the discussion will be led by Himanshu and uh, um, here are some um, potential discussion, um, discussion um, topics. So the first is the use of deep learning in recommender systems. with the other one decreased or one of your metrics got better the other one got worse and you had to figure out yeah. you had to make a decision about which one to prioritize usually it was consistent yeah uh, but we mostly focus on the NBCG when uh, there was like sort of this uh, sort of situation because it was uh, uh, it basically captures your order as well and as far as the tree is concerned like uh, the goal for the GBA model was to increase the precision at the top so again focusing on the NBCG Cool, thank you. Um, the other question was, and I think you probably mentioned this, but to what extent did the, the data on the songs have um, information about the song structure itself as opposed to like metadata about the song? Like, like tempo or something changing over time or, yeah. As opposed to like artist and year. And so as you see, there are like two different tracks for this challenge. One was the main track where you do not have any information about these sort of things about the songs. So you don't have any acoustics or anything related to that, to the song in particular, except the artist and the name and that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, it's just the metadata. Yeah, so that's the main track. Uh, the other part was the creative track, where you could actually go and use the waveform or whatever you want, yeah. pretty much. So uh, we didn't spend much time on the creative one, but what we did is we, we just uh, tried to use their API, one of their public APIs, and we grabbed a couple of uh, their metrics. So, so there, there's something like uh, oh. danceability, acoustics, and like some, some of like these. Like what? Sorry. Like danceability. Danceability. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they have like several of these weird uh, <laughs> metrics yeah. that they have. So like, like frequency at the downbeat or something like that. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how to calculate that, but they just provide okay. those things. So we just incorporated those in our uh, GBA model. Do you know, this may be verging on discussion, but do you know, um, whether generally people on the leaderboard were able to make better predictions when incorporating more information about the song structure itself, like in the creative track, did, did it get better? Uh, for us, actually, uh, incorporating those didn't help a lot because we actually didn't go to the waveforms, right? I mean, that might right. help. Uh, I think some of the teams that did look for, because there are like 2.2 million songs, right? Yeah. And you cannot just, you have to search for all of those. So I, I don't think anybody uh, spend a lot of effort, but there, I think there was one team, right, 
which probably actually uh, yeah I think there are papers which they actually use the uh, MFCC of the sun and then do like embedding which is I think it's like 2016 paper and then it helps a lot but then we don't have access to those because there's like copyright because if you have yeah. MFCC you basically have the sun yeah. so we actually don't have access to them I think internally they're actually using something like that thank you yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was Wondering about this matrix factorization, uh, because we have this 2.2 2 million times the point results and multiple words. So, uh, wasn't it computation expensive and to calculate that matrix factorization? Or how to do it? So, the question is uh, that how um, computation expensive is for the matrix factorization model. So, it will be very computationally expensive if you do it normally, so if you treat. So normally, um, when we work on um, academia data sets, we just use the dense matrix and then load everything into the RAM. But for that thing, it actually, for that data set, you actually do not, you have a one million times two million matrix. So what we use is sparse matrix and uh, we do sparse ALS updates on the user and item uh, factors. So those, so actually, the user and item mm, factor vectors are dense. So it's like 1 million times 200. That's the, the dimension of the uh, latent factor vector and the 2 million time, two, um, times 200. But uh, for the um, rating matrix or the R, R matrix that only consists of 1 or 0, we use sparse matrix that only um, like uh, record the indices that is non-zero of non-zero entries. So you basically do, do, do you have a specific algorithm of your own for doing the best? So, so like we have our own data structures um, and that an implementation of everything in Java which focuses on making it fast. But we use the public implementation of the public for the which is just yeah, using it as holding the these course. So you know, utilizing Java we're able to do it fast. Yeah, so it's Python, Python, so it's Java is possible to use yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, the, the, the other thing, like TensorFlow, and uh, most of these linear algebra libraries do uh, offer uh, operations on, on uh, sparse uh, matrices and vectors. I'm not sure if you can matrix, factorize matrix in, uh, in those, but, but they do offer sparse matrix in uh, Maybe I missed uh, like one part in the middle. So first say when you're doing uh, CNN embeddings, right? So <coughs> the the output of the CNN is it just like the time series split of training and testing for the later uh, sequence of the thing to do the the, the output is the playlist embedding. So when you feed uh, a couple of songs uh, put together, mm -hmm. uh, that basically gives you a representation of the uh, of the of the playlist embedding. And then you can later use that to do a dot product with all of your song vectors to give you the scores. A question from online. Um, have you tried any other methods for the second stage uh, other than uh, GBM? Uh, similar question for creating the song embedding. Uh, if yes, how did those perform? Second stage? Uh Mostly focus on yeah, GB, GB, because that's usually very, I think usually that's the best at giving you a good precision score. And it incorporates um, all, you can basically dump all the features which you can think about, and basically it takes care of giving you a really uh, good precision at the top. So usually we trust it's used for the second stage. I think there's some other cat boost and stuff. Maybe yeah, try and we boost. try just like gradient boosting things because it's like all well, the features you compare, they are like not very like regularized. They are like very weird features. For some with like super large values and very hard to use other values, sorry, other methods. But BGM, it doesn't care like the range or the type, like either it's sparse or not. You can just throw it in. Um, so, it's not an actually like a question. Uh, one thing that grabbed my attention that I liked a lot uh, that you have mentioned in your paper was how you guys handle the outliers, the most popular signs, right? If you want to explain a little, a little bit about it, because I think that's, that's a very interesting part. So, the question is that um, in our paper we mentioned that we use some sophisticated um, tricks to handle the um, popularity 
take issue of the uh, traditional user and user and item item neighbor based methods. So the problem is that we found that in traditional user user and item item matrix, the um, the recommended items found by these methods are actually skewed towards um, popular items. So that um, we additionally introduce a penalization um, term to penalize um, to I mean. We, um, I mean to squash the um, popularity by some certain exponents. And uh, so for more details, it can be, uh, please refer to our paper. And so the basic idea is that um, we want to find a balance between recommending the most relevant sounds and recommending the popular sounds. Be a generative model, or is it a generative model? Maybe. So the question is that um, it is about the relationship between our model and the generative model. So I think um, so. As I mentioned, there's similarity between our CN models and the, the language modeling. As language modeling is a generative model, so I think in its nature, our model is also generative. You just um, through using the language modeling uh, like architecture and uh, just um, one by one, just in an auto regressive way of generating the subsequent uh, sounds. So I want our authors to go, go through the discussion first, so let's let them go through them, then we ask more questions. Yeah. So Himanshu will lead the discussion, and there's, there are some um, points we have listed to um, for to be a potential discussion topic. The first is deep learning recommender system. So as we all know, deep learning um, has enjoyed tremendous uh, success in both vision and uh, and the NLP. And uh, but it's only until recently that the recommender system community has turned their attention to um, deep learning models. And uh, so we may discuss about the potential of applying deep learning in various cases of recommender systems. And also, um, as I said, we favored the CN models over RNs in our, um, C in our embedding model. And uh, so for a long time, RN has been the, the, like, the go-to choice for doing language modeling and other sequential stuff. But now it seems that CN is catching up and also the recently proposed transformer architecture with uh, which completely discards convolution rec rec recurrent connections is also showing very um, prominent performance with self-attention layers. And the third is um, about, um, so as I mentioned, in our model, we, except for the code stack, we use one model to um, solve all the tasks. So, and uh, actually um, for for the Rexis 2018 co competition, the second place team, they actually um, trained 10 models to deal with um, 10, these 10 categories of um, playlist continuation tasks. So we may have a discussion about um, which is better. So um, I think if we use one model, it's inher in inherently a multitask learning model so that your model can be trained on more data, but Mm, on the other side, if you train 10 sp task specific models, they may be better at doing their jobs for um, task spe specific playlist continuation um, tasks. And uh, also we may um, have a discussion about the future works of this paper. Well, I guess it's a two way discussion. Um, these are the, some of the points that we feel are quite relevant to our paper. Um, one of the things, the, the thing that I like most would be like this discussion between CNNs versus RNNs, because um, uh, although like uh, if you consider the speed and other things, uh, CNNs are pretty good, but then there's also options like mini batching and stuff like that. So I don't know what do you guys like uh, if if you have any experience with trying RNNs on recommendation models, you could probably talk about that. Uh, recently, so my colleague here, Joey, he worked on a WSTM Cup Challenge. And he actually used an RNN model for that, and that seemed to perform really well. So probably he can give you an overview of that as well. What's the WSTM? You want to tell about that? Oh, so it's something like you have you already have some playlist, but then 
you want to see like if the user is going to skip this song or not. Uh, yeah. Like a skip prediction challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a binary classification not on a sequential. Yeah. Interesting. I have a question related to that first point. Just deep learning recommender systems. Uh, so I'm very unfamiliar with this challenge and I guess deep learning and recommender systems and you showed one baseline, which is this popular baseline. Um, are there slightly more sophisticated but still heuristic sort of driven methodologies that kind of put, that we can sort of compare these results to? Like, I don't know, uh, let's say for example, you just predict a bunch of more songs by the same artists in the first 50 songs of the playlist. Or like how, how would the method compare to something like that? Just to, get, to give me a better sense of you know, what do these numbers on the leaderboard really mean when you compare it to a less intelligent system? So, yeah, for sure. Um, so the popularity baseline is basically that you just recommend the popular artists or popular songs. And that, that sort of does like really bad. Uh, I think there was a number there. Uh, so that's probably like 20 points or 30 points off. But in that case, it's not taking any of the plays specific information. It's always yeah, yeah, yeah. just it's the same right, recommendations right, no matter what, right? Uh, right, most, most of the time. Too. And that's especially for uh, the cold start when you do not have any information. So right. that's where uh, you basically see like how good uh, you can do if you include our cold start method, right. incorporate that instead of just like recommend. Because when you don't have any information, you just have a name uh, for a play that is really hard to yeah, suggest. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Well, I wonder if like, the item, item, and user, user would be an answer to this question. But you don't have, for the cool star, you don't have any item or user, right? So they don't have any items for the user. Right. So you can't. But he's really just know. asking if I understand right about a baseline. Yeah, baseline. Could you consider the, a baseline? The other, so not the cool star problem, but the other. Oh, yeah. The, the, so WRMF is like a popular baseline, actually. But the thing is, people usually don't. So whenever you see in papers, they usually always include WRMF, but they always show that it's doing really bad. And that's because they don't tune it. But we extensively tune it. And like we found out that if you tune it, it can beat like most of the methods that the state So it's yeah. all about tuning, yeah. The confidence score, if you see there's like a confidence score that is an alpha term and also the regularization. The combination of these two you can pretty much beat every state of the art method with a WRMF. So it's a very strong way. And that's why I use it as our first stage. Because that gives you a really high recall. So that's a fine-tuned version, I guess. Yeah, that's like a super fine-tuned version. Like we fine-tune a lot for getting that high score. Yeah. Do you have any idea? Any of either you or your competitors have used any type of graphs in a clustering form of frameworks? So clustering, uh, sort of. Um, if you look at the the scene, and basically that's also sort of a clustering thing, right? It's basically clustering based on the. Features it's like grouping. The, any embedding method is sort of you can think of it like as a clustering thing, right? Very good question. Based on graph features. clustering. Methods. Graph clustering. I don't think so. I saw any of those in the presentations. Was there? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think we tried random walks of graphs, but the most yeah, performance. I think software. we tried the yeah. random walks. Like no two-bit type of. Um, uh, no, it was not a GCN. It was just like random walk, I think. But it's really hard to, like, for things like that, it's really hard to know, like, how, how deep you're going to go or yeah. what should you be scared. Yeah. But the problem is, like, also, you have, you have overlaps between the clusters, so you cannot, and here you can find the properties of clusterings so you may not find the overlap. And also, the nature between the graph is, like, not that well defined, because, say, what, what would be your relation between the songs, right? You cannot just say, like, it's a linear graph, or you know, it's after this. And it's, it's really hard to, like, I, I assume you were talking about, like, say, using a graph convolution, right, with a GC and something, like, to get a node to that sort of stuff. Right. But, but, like, that, that, that relation here isn't that strong. And that's the reason uh, if, that you see that the CNN here is not as strong as the other methods. Because in language, uh, the relation is, like, really strong, right? The, the, the sequential nature is, like, very strong as compared to here, which is just, like, uh, people do add those songs in order, but that, that's really not as strong as in, say, you make a very major that that graph is. You can, for example, represent it as a directed graph. Uh, you have to uh, 
you have the sequences that you But how would you relate the playlist then? How, how would your playlist be uh, connected? Like for sure for a playlist and then you have songs and that could be a directed graph. But what about the different playlists? The task is to oh, find in different playlists, right? Is that no, but for running any inference, you need a complete graph. You cannot have just like two million, one million graph, uh, disconnected graphs, right? Well, you can do something. You can do something. For example, graph says your task. No, no, my question is like, how would you relate the different playlists? How would you place them to, in the graph? And the question would be like having a graph of, of, of uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the songs in the same play, playlist would share connection, right? Yeah, that, that could be a that directed graph. But and it's also that's like graph. a playlist and song. But what about different playlists? So the, uh, the question is uh, find a cluster of, uh, uh, try to find a cluster of this huge graph. You know, each, each cluster would correspond to a playlist. Isn't the connection okay. between different playlists similar to the connection between different users? Yeah. You know, it can be full. Mm. There is no point building a graph, right? You can just use each session as itself. Yeah. Like, if you want to build graph, it's like... No, because uh, you try to, for example, penalize uh, the relationships okay. by... Uh, We've uh, paused the graph let's, conversation. Yeah. Let's take it off on you. You're in trouble all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it now. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. No, uh, it's just, you guys are sitting in the back, so if you have trouble picking up the, the sound. Um, Okay, any other questions? So related to your third point, um, so it was, yeah, one model to learn the model. So uh, the, the second place team that had 10 different models, were they like significantly better on any of those 10 categories? Um, I, think I think so the question is that, um, is that uh, that. So, is, is there some categories that uh, the models? Yeah. Because you guys were overall better. Yeah. So, yeah. with their ten models, were they better so on we some never, categories? So, the system never evaluated on each of the categories. Yeah, so you don't know. I think there's a paper that submitted that was like uh, released by the uh, organizers of the competition that includes that mm -hmm. competition mm -hmm. that com comparison mm -hmm. about ten different categories, and uh, I think. We were top on most of the ten, but it's indeed the case that in some in some categories we did not achieve the top one performance. So um, I think uh, uh, anyone who is interested in performance in different cat ten categories should refer to their paper. Uh, it's on the second page. Yeah. It's uh, I think. It's this paper, so an analysis of approaches taken in ACM Record Challenge 2018 for automatic credit continuation. Yeah. So I have a question about the first point of your discussion, which is about using the deep learning and recommendation systems. So my question is, if you were to do this again, and using deep learning, how would you do it? So the question is that, um, how we would do using deep learning um, if we will take this competition. So, um, I mean, like for, um, for years, recommender systems have been about um, collaborative filtering and the uh, user user, but now I think people started to be more focused on content and metadata. So deep learning provides a way to extract features um, in using a cascade of non-linear uh, units from coerced to like fine grain. And uh, I think one um, possible avenue for future work is to um, find a way to use deep learning method together with, to work together with the metadata that's provided in the playlist. So, um, but there, we need to be careful tuning, like in which stage we add in these features. And uh, also, as I mentioned, um, we used CNNs for our language modeling, but it seems that the transformer architecture is the new rising star. And uh, given the large amount of data in this competition, I think we can train a uh, um, large transformer uh, model um, with deep uh, from scratch. So, so, so I was going to suggest that, but but you just said, and I agree with that, that the, the um, 
um, the word, uh, word by word sort of uh, connection isn't as strong as, uh, and that's where the attention shows its, uh, you know, uh, use. Uh, mostly, so self attention is really expensive, right? It's for per each word you're getting. Um, so I'm not sure if that's like. I, I mean, sure that. I, I mean, I can I can imagine that it could perf uh, increase the performance, but would it be worth the computation? Um, I guess that's that's my take. Given that, like, if you have if you have a series series of songs, like your eighth or and ninth, it probably wouldn't make too much of a difference if you switch the order, right? Uh, for language, it would. Um, so, so I don't know. That's just a comment for thought. Mm. I, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think the sequence here. I mean, if you look at the problem, like from like a, a broader perspective, um, the sequence is not that important as, as of like in, in, in words, right? So, as you said, like okay, if 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 the recommended song is number nine or number ten, that doesn't make that much difference. <coughs> or at least we think so, right? Exactly. We, 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 you never know. Like humans are really close to the that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. As someone who has made a lot of playlists of a time in my life when I then like made the album art for them as well, there is I don't know if this is relevant if you only have the metadata, but there is like there's a flow, right? Like where some songs sure. matter more, some songs, like there's like an ebb and flow. So I yeah. wonder if even if the exact order in many cases might not matter, there's something that you could pull out of that flow, yeah. right? Like even if it's like just beats per minute where you like have closer ones together that are yeah. more similar and then that comes back a couple songs later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, you, that's you, open, you open the discussion to another, another uh, perspective. I think it depends a lot on, on that person who's listening to the song, right? Yeah. The, the mood of the person. Sometimes you're in the mood to listen to like some exact sequence, right? You know, you, you just want to listen to this one, this one, and this one. But sometimes you, you're open to maybe listen to some like random stuff, right? So yeah. I think it, it also depends on, on your mood and the type of the person that you are, and then it, it again changed the whole problem. I'm not bit. sure if the data set has the mood, but it's <laughs> <laughs> very useful. Yeah. We definitely found out that there is something because that's the reason the scene and contributes the most. So definitely and that's why they kept the metric like that, I guess. And definitely that that helps. But yeah, definitely the relation I say wouldn't be that strong as in as in the language for sure. But sure. definitely there is there is sequential nature to it. Yeah. For sure. Actually uh, so to add on uh, on point, so transformer is uh, like worse than C and and, and R is at, at capturing this temporal orders. So because basically if you only use self attention then you have the model has not don't have doesn't have a sense of uh, like relative position so what it's not self attention that adds to transformer the, the the temporal like dependency it's the position encoding embedding right. of that so That's correct, yeah. i think if there's like no strong temporal orders then transformer should be a like, favorable choice because it's, there are some analysis in NLP showing that actually that's when modeling long range um, dependencies, that's the weak point of the existing transformer architecture. And the problem comes from the position embedding. I understand they use position, if, if I may interject otherwise. Um, uh, no, I understand like to, to actually sort of give the, the signal that the, what the order is is position encoding. Uh, but at each point in time, uh, what you attend to, uh, which is the nature of self-attention, is really crucial to the to their performance, right? Um, I think what I'm saying is more along the lines of um, maybe that, mu that much attention uh, at, at each time step, um, maybe it's not, you know, as, you know, like necessary, but, I mean, uh, if it performs better, if you have compute power, then why not? Right? Um, yeah, so there's a trade-off between how fancy your model is and uh, how, like, how simple it is. Yeah. So for this competition, it's actually, um, you need to work on uh, like industry level, uh, industry scale data. So um, that's why our model does not look so fancy, but um, we made that choice deliberately to reduce the um, amount of training time and uh, for fast inference. Rewind a bit and ask. Uh, so, are these uh, all user-created playlists? And if so, uh, 
Um, is there any metric around whether or not they're actually good playlists? Do people just play? <laughs> <laughs> mm, so the question is that is there any good metric for a good playlist? I think maybe given that our model is very strong, it, <laughs> let's just decide whether how, how much it like fits our model's prediction. If it perfectly. Uh, yeah. 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 Or would we even say like, that the, the, it's the, listen, the, the listening time, for instance, if, if there is a playlist, uh, we can we can check out the listening yeah. time, right? If if they listen from the start to till, till the end, so it means like if, I, I I interpret that as like it, it's a good playlist because they started from the beginning and they listen to every song or number of views or, or like number of stars or something. Yeah. yeah. But does it matter if it's good? Actually, so it reminds me of something. There's uh, some one metric that may potentially indicate how good it is. It is the number of followers of this playlist. So it's interesting maybe to find this. Um, if the number of followers is larger when this, um, and our model predicts it pr pr prediction matches uh, better for them. So like business value even if not necessarily like good by my standards right now. <laughs> Um, we have, okay, a quick question. So, um, so one, this question is more about the matrix factorization side of things. So there are quite a few ways to uh, make them more cost effective. So one of them was using sparse matrices. Um, uh, the, uh, another would be uh, sort of sampling, uh, or randomly sampling, or use some sampling method uh, from, from the big matrix. Um, another one that I like better would be just use variational autoencoder. Like, ha have you thought about that part? Like, um, can we just use any autoencoding methods? Um, to, to tackle that? I, I haven't thought it through, but. Uh. The second place solution, they use order. It wasn't variation, but it was an order encoder, actually. It was pretty important. They, I think second or third? Third thing. Second. Second, second thing. Yeah. yeah, they use order encoders. Yeah, how, do you, how would they, uh, do you happen to know how would they, um, so I, I know how, how, it would, how they would encode and, and compress, but how, because um, like, would they use it the same way as you use with, uh, for collaborative filtering? Like, well, how, how would it yeah. work? It's just the same way as fiber filling. So they, the input and output are the same. It's like a one hot vector of like two million sounds. And then if it's in the playlist, it's one. So it's like a vector of two million sounds. Uh -huh. And then you reduce it to some dimension, then you like, you know, decode it into the same two million. And then mm -hmm. you will get values and then you rank them. Okay. So treat it as the factor. Yeah, treat it as how good it is to the playlist. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, I, I use them because they're less memory intensive uh, usually. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering how long about the same memory as the as the metric spec. Okay. All right. Uh, another question from online: Was the fast training and inference time inference time part of the criteria for the competition? So, for uh, that competition, it's not actually the criteria, but um, we found it to be very important because the, um, fast inference and test and training allows us to um, iterate faster over our ideas. And uh, for example, for the second team's solution, they use deep learning and uh, an autoencoder, denoising autoencoders for recommended. I think they mentioned that they use four GPUs and uh, for each model they need to train three or four days. and. Uh, if you want to like tune hyperparameters and uh, other things, it's quite painful. So, I so so my my answer would be that it's not um, relevant to how automatically or ultimately the model will be ranked, but it definitely helps us to get higher results on the leaderboard. Okay. I just want to know for your best knowledge, what is uh, sophisticated? Algorithm in the industrial products, which kind of all algorithm of the recommendation systems that you think like the Amazon, eBay, and this kind of thing. It's mostly collaborative filtering. Yeah. Yes, we I saw the presentations. I don't know, I think user here, WR, but that's what mostly everybody uses. So yeah. there are a couple of presentations from Netflix and other companies that were at uh, the, the conference. I think most of them they just use like yeah. audio users or item I think for so stuff. For their problem, it's even harder because they need, it's preferably to be some online learning algorithms that um, can be applied to their algorithm. 
because for us we are just like generating this recommendation for one time, but there, um, for their like um, tech giants, their like uh, website is visited by a huge number of visitors every day, and they need to update their model. If it's too like costly, then they cannot afford it. Even even they then cannot afford it. Are they stable for online learning? Like, is it good for online learning, or is it like kind of unstable? Well, I think um, it's quite stable for, especially when you are doing gradient descent algorithm for optimizing. So gradient descent is naturally, if you do stochastic gradient descent, it's naturally a, an online algorithm. You do, you, you do not need to do uh, much modification for that. And uh, if you are using ALS, it's actually quite stable as well. You just need to um, reframe your, your, um, your R matrix. And then before, if you train the ARS um, from scratch, you need to iterate for 10 epochs. And now maybe you only need to iterate for one epoch. Then it already captures everything you need for doing good recommendations. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.